Stuff sometimes just comes out. On page 416, <clears throat> so here's how what happened. Let me give you a little story and timeline. These brownfields created all these problems, and what the government did was go through and try and rank all of these brownfield uh, industrial sites, and they put them on what was called the National Priorities List, the NPL, and they were going to clean them up. So what EPA did was go to the government, and they said, look, we need some money to clean that up. <clears throat> the government created this thing called the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Short name is CERCLA. An even shorter name I want you to write in your book is called Superfund. Superfund. And the reason it was called Superfund, remember this is 1980. They gave $9 billion, with a B, dollars to clean up. That was such a big number in 1980s, they called it Superfund. All right? Bank of America lost half of that in eight hours last summer. So that's how much money has changed. But that was such a big number, they nicknamed it Superfund. And what CERCLA did was said, okay, we're going to pay to clean these up, but... When you get to change the rules in a game when it's your turn, you almost always win. That's what CERCLA did. CERCLA changed the rules. Most notably, they changed the rules of who they're going to go after. They went after these people called PERPs, PRPs, the potentially responsible parties. Yes, we'll pay for it, but we're going to go after the people that made the mess and get our money back for them. And here's what they created. They created three types of liability. Three types of liability. The first liability was called strict liability. Meaning, if you owned the property, you made the mess. No excuses. Everybody got blamed. From the inception to the day they had to close that property, anybody that was in that title chain of ownership is now liable. Strict liability. Everybody did it. Everybody made the mess. The second type of liability was, and because of that, we're going to go after people jointly or severally. And severally means what? One. So we're going to go after one person or all of them. So if you've ever owned that property and we had to pay to clean it up, we are going, you caused the problem, that's strict, and we're going after as many people as we need to to get our money back. And if that's not a kicker, the third one is it's retroactive, meaning they can go back as far in time as they wanted to. So the third liability was retroactive. So here we are in 1980 doing this cleanup, and CERCLA comes out and says, yes, we'll loan you the money, but if you own the property in 1920 for two days, we're coming after you. You caused the problem. I can sue joint and severally, and we can go back as far in time as we want to go back to chase any and everybody we want. All right? So it's real easy for somebody to win a game when they get to change the rules, and the rules were we made everybody responsible, we're chasing everybody, and I don't care if we weren't even in existence in 1920, we're still blaming you and coming after you for it. All right? So CERCLA blows through this money like a sailor on leave. All right? So the government goes back and says, we uh, need more money. So the government came up with this term called SARA, which stands for the Superfund, remember that was the nickname, Amendment and Reauthorization Act. They are going to reauthorize more money to CERCLA so to clean these up, because the cleanup was way a lot, a lot more than they thought. They gave them $9 billion, They blew through it. Sarah comes along and says, we'll give you more money, 
but did you guys see the movie Stripes? Yeah. Yep. In the movie Stripes, the guy says, my name's Francis. Call me Francis, I'll kill you. Touch my stuff, I'll kill you. And the sergeant says, what? Lighten up, Francis. Sarah says, lighten up, Circla. We will reauthorize you another $9 billion, but you are way too strict. And in order to give you this, we want you to lighten up. So Sarah created this thing called the Innocent Landowner Act. And the bad thing for you guys is kind of like 14 names. Landowner Immunity Act, the Innocent Landowner Act, the Immunity Act. But basically what it says is this. If you are the landowner and you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt there is no way that you created the problem or that you were lied to when you bought the property, so say someone said, yeah, but we cleaned it all up. So you bought it thinking it was clean and they falsified documents. You could actually go in front of circle and go, wait a minute, we're innocent. We did not mean to get involved in this loop, so we don't want to do it. Okay? That's what Sarah came along and gave this opportunity. So now it's not so strict. There's at least some opportunity for someone to get out. All right? So if you bought an old gas station and you opened Kim's Flower Shop and they came after you, Kim, you could go, well, wait a minute, time out. There is no way I created this problem with uh, brown fields and hazardous chemicals. I'm a flower shop. I sell roses. That's it. You could potentially go, okay, you're right. You didn't do it. But let's say you open Kim's Flower Shop and small engine repair. <laughs> Hell of a combination. They, you, they could go, well, you know, dude, there's a chance that you might have caused some problems because you got motor oil and engine oil and brake fluids and all. Yeah, we're not letting you out. All right. So the Innocent Landowner Act was presented for people. If you bought the property after the uh, property was identified too, that's another thing. Suppose the NPL identified the brownfield in 1980 and you buy it in 86, that would be another reason you might be able to get out because it was, they already recognized it was a problem before you got in there. So it did create kind of an immunity status for people. Now, what does this mean for you guys? Couldn't mean a lot. Remember, care. Do not let your client get harmed. You may have to simply say, call an environmental person, all right? Now, there's one last thing I want to talk about in the environmental world. It's called the, uh, the ESA, the Environmental Side Assessment on 418. If you get into commercial, this is probably another thing that you guys will get involved with. <clears throat> Remember I asked you the other day how much a $100,000 commercial property is worth if there's a $2 million environmental cleanup? And we said what? Zero, because the transferability issue can't transfer the property. How would you like to have been the bank that loaned the current owner that hundred grand? Uh, you're pretty screwed, aren't you? So now we have created these ways for banks to protect themselves from getting in that position. On page 418, under the environmental side assessment, we have this thing called a phase one environmental assessment. A phase one environmental assessment, remember in title work we talked about chain of title and we said Bob sold it to Sue, sold it to Mary, sold it to Bill and it took into account the owners. A phase one is virtually the same thing only instead of looking at the owners it looks at what the properties was used for. So it's a desk audit, somebody's going to search the records, and what they're going to look is the property on 12 Smith Street. Well, we don't really care about the owners yet. What we really care about was it was a gas station to a gas station to a gas station to a car lot to a flower shop. That's what a phase one is. It's a chain of title, so to speak, but instead of looking at owners, 
it looks at the use of the property. That use will tell the professional the probability that there is leaking underground storage tanks, there's used chemicals, all of that. So at the end of a phase one, the professional that is doing it has to make a decision, and one of his decisions might be, we better do a phase two. A phase two is literally where they drill and bore into the ground and bring out a big soil sample that's eight or 10 or 12 feet deep, and they take it to a lab, like we ran, and said, can you find straight eight in this dirt, all right? Straight eight, anybody know what that is? Octane, gasoline, eight carbons. It's a business slang, looking for, or the other one's methyl ethyl death. That's any bad chemical, that's a generic name. Did you find any MED, methyl ethyl death? Yeah, we found something. When we check the dirt, if we find octane in the dirt, guess what that means? There was an underground storage tank that leaked. So now you gotta remediate it, and if you guys have seen that thing where it says clean fill dirt wanted, that's what they're trying to do. They're digging out all that dirt that was contaminated, and they gotta dig it all out and pack it all back in with clean dirt, and then they do another phase two, and we go, oh, it's clear, now they can sell it with no hazardous problem. That's how the banks get out of, a dodge that bullet, so to speak. When a buyer says, I wanna buy a corner lot, it's over on the corner of Smith and Jones, I need to borrow $100,000. Before the bank loans the money, they're gonna go, time out, have you got a phase one on this property? Because we wanna know what it was. And if the phase one says, it was gas station to gas station to gas station, we're not loaning you the money. We don't wanna get caught in example I gave you. Dry cleaners have perk. You buy a dry cleaner. They're going to force you to have dry cleaners, gas stations, most any days now, you just go straight to a phase two because you pretty much know there's a problem. Just bypass that and let's start the drilling. All right? But that's how banks do that. You guys might be involved in those. All right? hey, we need to get a phase one on this environmental. Or if I'm the buyer, I want to ask the seller, have you got a phase one yet? And those are timed as well. <coughs> oh yeah, I got a phase one dated 1948. Uh, gotta have a new one. It's gotta be pretty current, all right? An environmental impact statement. Remember we talked yesterday about how a developer is going to put uh, a plan together for his development. One of them might be wetlands. Almost all big developers now have biologi biologists on staff that come up with these, how does this housing addition impact the environment? Are we rerouting a creek? Are we taking down trees where the three-toed sloth owl hangs? Or whatever it is, I don't know. So there's an environmental impact statement, okay? So all I'm telling you is you must be careful with these and your biggest key typically is let's call a professional. And if you're in the residential world, lead-based paint's probably your number one issue. All right, any questions? Nope. All right.